Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Raffelli webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speakers are Alice Mitchell and Andrew Harvey. Alice is a junior professor at the Institute for Africanistics and Egyptology at the University of Cologne. She's interested in the diversity of ways in which humans use language to mediate their relationships with others, particularly at the fine-grained level of everyday interaction. Her research to date has mostly focused on language and social relations among the Totoka speakers of Tanzania, with whom she has conducted almost two years of linguistic and ethnographic fieldwork. Her current project explores how Totoka speaking children are socialized into kinship relations for everyday linguistics and bodily practice. Andrew is a research fellow at Leiden University Center for Linguistics. The title of his current funded research is Gorba Hatsa and Tihanzu, Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley Area. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evidenced through linguistics arts and language contact. Um, today, Alice and Andrew will be providing us with an update on the Riddle Workshop of the Rift Valley Network. Um, so I would say, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, and hello to all, all of you here today. Thanks for joining us. So as many of you know, uh, for just over a year now, a group of Rift Valley Network members have been investigating riddling traditions in Rift Valley languages from a comparative perspective. And in today's talk, we wanted to give you an update about this collaborative project. Um, we wanted to make it very clear that though Andrew and I are the ones presenting today, it's really joint work um, with contributions from all the people listed on this slide. So please bear, bear that in mind. Um, all right, so to start off with, we wanted to say something about the rationale behind and the scope of our project. As we all know, the Tanzanian Rift Valley has been defined as a contact area, and this area is what our research network is all about. And we wanted to come up with a manageable collaborative project within the Rift Valley Network in the spirit of Kiesling et al 2008, um, where we could combine people's expertise in different languages to look at a particular phenomenon from an aerial lens. And we chose riddles uh, for several reasons. First of all, they're fun. Um, they're creative, they're entertaining to work with. In many cases, they're also, you know, aesthetically very, very pleasing and enjoyable. Second, they're an accessible topic, so they're relatively easy to identify and collect, and their short form makes their analysis uh, a little bit less onerous than other genres. And thirdly, um, we already had some good documentation of riddles for some Rift Valley languages, um, and Andrew will say more about that in a moment. So our goals with this project are twofold. Um, first of all, we aim to be able to say something about the extent of variation as well as possible convergence in riddling traditions in the Rift Valley. Um, and second, we aim to experiment with online only collaboration within the network and see how far it can get us. I should say with respect to the first goal, um, one difficulty we face is explaining any commonalities that we find because riddles are obviously very widespread across Africa and shared features that we identify may have much wider aerial purchase than the Rift Valley. This is something we, we might be able to talk about in the discussion period. So these questions of contact are quite tricky. We're not gonna make any big claims about, um, about this topic today. Rather, it's about taking first steps to establish basic points of similarity and difference in riddling traditions of languages spoken in the Tanzanian Rift Valley. Um, so in our approach to riddles, we've been looking at four different dimensions or parameters of riddling practices. First of all, what we're calling their communicative ecology, uh, so their context of use, their functional role, social dynamics, and so on. Second, we're considering discourse structure, so how riddles are introduced, posed, and answered. Third, we're looking at grammatical and linguistic properties of riddles, um, in particular the riddle description itself. And finally, we're investigating conceptual and stylistic properties of riddles. So we're thinking about things like imagery, sound symbolism, um, and the semantic or formal relation between a riddle description and the answer. Um, and many of us in the group are also interested in more performative aspects of riddles, but this topic is quite difficult to investigate using the um, data that we currently have available to us. 
So our plan for the talk today is to kind of take you through each of these four areas, um, tell you where we're at with each of them. But first of all, Andrew is going to give a brief overview of um, how the project's been going, who's been involved in the various activities we've been engaged in. Yes, so um, I'd like now to provide a little bit more context by giving a concise idea uh, or a concise timeline of our idea. So on and off, riddles and riddling uh, in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area have received varying degrees of attention, typically by linguists and anthropologists. So for example, Frederick Johnson in 1931 for Nilamba, Eric Tenra in the 60s for Sandawi and Howard Olson for Nyaturu, and uh, Rift Valley Network member uh, Martin Mouse at the turn of the century for Iraq. Um, it was, in fact, uh, Martin who suggested to Rift Valley Network member and local Gorwa language researcher Festo Masani uh, that he undertake an examination of riddles in Gorwa for his uh, master's dissertation, a project which he began in late 2019. And by early 2020, there have been some marginal conversations in the Rafali network about undertaking a collaborative project, and Festo's work inspired us to explore riddles and riddling. Alice led us in a two-month reading group dedicated to riddles and riddling practices, especially in an African context, culminating in a half-day workshop in November 2020 featuring short talks on five riddling traditions in and around the uh, Rift Valley area. Um, from this work, our examination of riddles continued to present in two sort of primary ways. Um, the first is the creation of a database of riddles. This is essentially a big spreadsheet which lists all of the riddles we can find in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, as well as several other uh, African languages. Some of this comes from previously published sources and some of it is uh, individuals' original field work. So uh, currently the database contains around 1600 riddles uh, and the languages making up the database as well as the portion of the database which they make up is shown here. Uh, and as we can see, the languages of the Rift makes up about two thirds of the overall database. Note that uh, for most of the riddles, we actually have English translations for both the description as well uh, as the solution though not for all of them. Uh, and of course, for anyone who has attempted working with riddles in any ways, we know that their translation can be very difficult. So already this represents a great effort. Um, the database in turn feeds into a second sub-project, um, that being the draft of what we, will, we hope will eventually uh, turn into a publication on riddles and riddling in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. And that's been the focus of several sittings of contributing members with fortnightly writing sessions having taken place for around the past two months uh, and a lot of other work sort of on the margins. Um, and so having established a rough timeline of what we've done and what we are doing, uh, we'd like now to provide a few details on what we found or what we're currently investigating. So I'll turn it back to Alice. Yeah, so turning to our first parameter of interest, um, the term communicative ecology is intended to refer to the socio-cultural context in which riddles are used, um, the spatio-temporal setting functions, as well as their vitality as a genre. And we're gonna keep the discussion of this parameter fairly brief as many of the relevant features are quite commonplace for riddle traditions more broadly. Um, so for example, there's a strong association um, between riddling and evening time in the Rift Valley, uh, but that's likely true of riddle traditions in, in many, many parts of the world. Um, one interesting observation here is that sometimes the temporal restriction of riddling is normatively policed with an explicit taboo on daytime riddling, uh, as we find in Iraq. We're also seeing that riddles are typically the domain of uh, children and their caregivers and often don't typically involve adult men. Um, but again, this seems to hold across many different riddling traditions in Africa. One major point of difference across the different um, language communities in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area is the presence or absence of a riddling tradition in the first place. So we find riddles in all languages of the Rift Valley area except Hadza, where there doesn't appear to be such a tradition and speculations on why that might be are very welcome in the discussion. Another interesting point of difference that we've noted is um, seasonal restrictions on riddling. So Tenra discussed a prohibition of riddling among the Sandawe during the rainy season, 
um, which is not something we've encountered among other, other communities where riddles can be practiced any time of year. Uh, and one last commonality I'll mention from a language ecology perspective is that riddles appear to be on the decline everywhere um, as the ecological niche that they formerly occupied as a domestic evening post-work activity um, has changed on account of new evening practices and activities, things like homework, TV, uh, people spending more time outside of the domestic space during the evenings. Um, and changing household social structure probably also play a role here. Again, something that we're finding um, in many parts of the world. So I'd like to now provide a comment on discourse structure, which is largely uniform across the languages of our sample. We'll refer to the speech event in which riddles occur as a riddling session, uh, as in Harry's 1971. And a riddling session is made up of multiple riddles, uh, which we'll refer to as riddle exchanges. So the structure of a riddle exchange, we can analyze in terms of component utterances. And in most of the languages uh, of our sample, the riddle exchange is structured as follows. So um, one speaker, we'll, we'll call them A, uh, gives issues a challenge, uh, usually uh, by the utterance of uh, the first part of a set formula. And uh, a speaker B, who has either been specifically targeted by speaker A or sort of volunteers themselves from, from a group of, of possible um, answerers, uh, uh, sort of signals acceptance of the challenge, usually by the utterance of the second part of that set formula. So then um, speaker A will, will issue the riddle description or the riddle itself, as, as many people would think about it. And, uh, and then sort of th there are two different uh, pathways that we could go down. And that's, um, so B answers the riddle, they provide the riddle solution. And then often uh, it's their uh, turn to provide a riddle then. So then they, the speaker B can, can actually issue a challenge uh, to either the same speaker or a different speaker, or um, the uh, answer does not know the answer. They either answer incorrectly or uh, they answer uh, by silence. So there's a certain admittance of failure that needs to occur. If, if the speaker B admits failure that they can't answer the riddle, um, this uh, sort of bargaining back and forth will happen. Um, so, um, so often what will happen is, uh, often what will happen is there's a bargaining back and forth for payment. And when, the, uh, and when speaker B uh, can, can produce this payment that's, uh, that's satisfactory to speaker A, well, then um, the speaker A will, will accept the payment and will give the solution. And then A, it's A's uh, right again to continue uh, posing challenges. So we've noticed that while um, sort of the, the, the very straightforward um, uh, sort of uh, route here where, where speaker B actually gives the answer is sort of well understood, um, the routine that takes place if the answer fails seems rather understudy. So our work has found a lot of sort of interesting details on this. So for example, payment is given in various ways. So you can pay for a riddle uh, by offering the riddler uh, a, a place, a person, um, either fictional or, uh, or an actual person that you know, um, an economically attractive commodity such as cattle, for example. But there's often room for the riddler and the answer to bargain back and forth, as I said, with the, with the riddler not accepting just any old offer, but actually one that they deem to be good. So in fact, this was one of the key functions of uh, riddles as described by Ihanzu interviewees when asked about uh, how do riddles teach people? So in addition to the rhetorical skill inherent in posing and answering riddles, um, the act of giving and getting payment is also one of showing off your knowledge of places, so the bigger and the more prosperous places are often preferred as offers to, to buy the answer to a riddle. And even people in the community, so people who are seen as uncooperative or even as practicing witchcraft are generally not accepted as payments for riddles. All right, our third parameter is to explore um, grammatical or formal aspects of riddles and particularly the riddle description or the challenge itself. And I should say this is um, probably the least developed area of our work so far, but I'll mention a few aspects that we've been considering. So one thing of interest to us is the syntactic structure of riddles, um, whether the description is just a single noun phrase, um, as in example one, a pumpkin root, um, a 
um, a single clause, as in two, this child of mine has four legs from Gorua, uh, or something more elaborate. And in, in many of the languages, we find riddles composed of two clauses, um, joined either by a conjunction or just straightforwardly juxtaposed. But it looks like structures rarely get more complex than that. So it seems that pithiness, i.e. being short but extremely expressive, is characteristic of, if not definitive of, prototypical for the genre of riddle. And we have recorded some slightly longer narrative structures consisting of multiple clauses in Ihanzu. Uh, and we're considering whether these forms might be better classified under the rubric of dilemma tales, um, which are also common across the African content continent. Another question related to syntax um, is also whether there's anything special or different about the syntax of riddles. Um, in the only language of the sample that I'm qualified to say anything about, um, in Datoga, there does seem to be, there do seem to be some structures that um, wouldn't occur in everyday conversation. So that's something to look at uh, further. Um, all right. And the next grammatical property that we've been having a look at is sentence type. So in our collection, um, the majority of riddle descriptions are declarative clauses with far fewer interrogative constructions. So for those languages that we've calculated this for so far, it's usually less than 10% um, of the collection in interrogative form, with the possible exception of ma, which seems to have quite a few interrogative riddles. Um, though most of our, our Maasai riddle collection comes from Kenyan Maasai, so, so obviously geographically a little bit distant from our Rift bit, um, Tanzanian Rift Valley area. And then in addition to uh, declaratives and interrogative clauses, we also find some imperative constructions. So here's an example from Gisam Janga Datoga, where the riddle is sweep here so that the people with the metal anklets can dance, um, the answer being rain, a really beautiful riddle. One of the reasons that we were interested to look at sentence type um, in the first place is because some of us had the intuition that European riddles tend to be posed as questions. So for things like what has eyes but cannot see. Um, and so this would then form a kind of nice point of contrast with the Rift Valley riddles. On further inspection of collections of traditional riddles, um, first of all, in English and German, we actually find that intuition was not correct. So there are a very large number of declarative form riddles in these languages as well. Um, however, and, and quite interesting, it seems that at least in English riddles in interrogative form, the question word in the riddle is targeting the answer, right? So you're getting lots of what, what can do X. Um, whereas the Rift Valley riddle riddles in interrogative form don't seem to work like that. They don't directly elicit the riddle object, but they have a more rhetorical function. Um, so another example here from Sandawi this time, grandmother, why have you thrown me down? Um, the question is not you know, directly answering uh, or eliciting the, the answer. And the answer here is snot. Um, all right. And then uh, an additional property we've started to analyze is the perspective from which the challenge is posed. So for example, the majority of Datoga riddles in our collection involve third person reference, but we do sometimes get personification of inanimate objects via the use of first or second person subjects and or possessives, um, as in example five from Iraq. So my house is built, but the entrance is missing. Um, and the stylistic effects of this kind of person marking, which I should also say is quite common in, in other parts of the world as well, um, might be interesting to think about in more detail. So does it perhaps make riddles more vivid or immediate by mapping the voices of these inanimate objects, as it were, onto the speech participants? Um, thinking about perspective is also an example of how we can't necessarily separate grammatical properties of riddles from their more stylistic or rhetorical considerations. Uh, so we maybe need to think more carefully about these four dimensions that we've divided this talk into. Um, so that was a few points relating to the grammar of riddles. Um, obviously, fairly basic. There's lots more we could we could do here. But one of the barriers to saying much more about the grammar of riddles is that Though much of our data is translated into English, much less of it has been passed and glossed. So if we do want to delve deeper into the language of riddles, this work would be a priority for us. So our fourth and final parameter of interest is what we're calling conceptual and stylistic properties of riddles. Uh, and so one thing we're looking at here is the imagery and the conceptual themes that riddles contain. 
And a very basic question we can ask here is whether any riddles are direct translations of each other, right? So how much is shared? Can we identify any riddles that look like they might be borrowed from one language to another? And we've not looked at this exhaustively yet, but there do seem to be a few examples of, of borrowed riddles. I'll show you one in a second. Um, on the other hand, many do seem to be highly language specific. They're also quite difficult to translate into another language because they're drawing on linguistic aspects, um, linguistic features, which I'll say more about in a moment as well. So one efficient way to look at possible conceptual overlaps um, in, in different riddling traditions is to start from the solution and then gather all the riddle descriptions um, that we have for that particular solution. So this allows us to see the wide range of ways of conceptualizing different objects, um, both across languages, but also within the same language. So I've got an example here where the solution is um, hearthstones or hearth. That's a very common riddle object in our collection. Um, as, as you all know, hearthstones are, are highly symbolic objects in many communities, so they're perhaps quite an obvious target for a riddle. And across the languages in our sample, um, riddle descriptions very frequently draw on the number of stones, which is three. So you can see that in the table from, I've just got the English translations here, Sandawe, my three people do very much work. Nyaturu, they come in threes from here to Europe. Iraku, the boys of our house are three. If one is absent, my house does not get up. Ihanzu, grandfather's house, has three poles, and Datoga, three, three, until it goes to the Marembe, to the Mbulu Highlands. So this kind of similarity is probably best explained in terms of conceptual salience rather than contact. Um, if you're thinking about the properties of hearthstones, the fact that there are three of them is probably what stands out. Um, though I should mention we have another Iraqu riddle that doesn't, doesn't refer to the number. Um, Looking a bit more closely, though, we do see some more extensive conceptual overlap between the Datoga riddle and the Nyaturu riddle. So in both of those, you have the idea of three entities either coming or going from relatively far away, i.e. meaning these, these objects are very widespread. Um, and we also find a very similar riddle in another Tanzanian language, Hehe, specifically, they are in threes the whole way to Europe. So there looks like there is there is something perhaps um, some contact maybe there because these these three are so conceptually close to each other. To give another example of conceptually very similar riddles in two different languages, um, I've got the following two riddles from Iraq and Datoga. These are communities that have been in contact for a long time, a lot of intermarriage and so on. So you can kind of imagine the context in which riddles might have been borrowed. So the answer to both riddles is um, the dung of a white cow and the dung of a black cow. Uh, and the riddle description, so for Iraq, we have, you don't recognize the footprints of your mother and those of our mother in the Mamu meeting. And in Datoga, the women reward each other by smearing butter on each other's foreheads and you can't recognize your mother. Obviously they sound much, much nicer in their original languages. Um, so in both riddles, we have this idea of not recognizing some index of your mother, either her face or her footprints, um, among a group of other women. Um, so, you know, really quite close. But then certain aspects of the description are, are very distinctive. So the, the Datoga riddle makes reference to the cultural practice of smearing butter on someone's head, which is something that happens during wedding ceremonies, among other things. I'm not sure if that's the case uh, among Iraq. Crispina can tell me about that after the talk. Um, so yeah, it looks like it's kind of been fitted into a Datoga cultural setting there. It looks like a very good candidate for a borrowed riddle. Um, Maybe we can think about the possible direction of borrowing in our discussion. One point um, to make here is that the word for dung in Iraq is feminine, gender. Uh, so the use of mother in the, in the description maybe functions as a clue to the answer here, which would then point to a Iraq origin, but that's just purely speculative. Um, continuing with the theme of imagery, we've observed that the shape of objects often provides the conceptual link between the description and the solution. So, for instance, uh, we get things like trees and arrows um, in the descriptions for objects like needle, needles and spheres. Um, metaphors based on shape are probably very, very common across cultures. Possibly slightly more culturally specific is the use of celestial bodies um, being conceptualized as herders. 
Uh, that's a theme that we find in the riddles of the closely related languages, um, Nyiramba, Nyatu, and Hanzu, but we do also see this in Iraq. So we have this beautiful riddle, Pharaoh herds from a high cliff where the answer is moon. Um, and we also notice some more kind of culturally specific imagery. Iraq and Gorowa use the celestial bodies as images for flowers on the plains, um, which is not observed elsewhere in our collection. And then as a final example, the image of vomiting for the work of, uh, for working with a grinding stone um, is found in Iraq and Gorowa, but also uh, among the Ateso from Uganda outside of our Tanzanian Rift Valley. Um, so, yeah, some, some interesting food for thought there as to, uh, as to cultural context or whether you need certain material culture to, to stimulate these kinds of um, images. Another feature of riddles that we've been looking at in our collection is the creative use of personal names. Um, so names can provide clues to the solution, both in terms of gender in our South Cushitic languages, as well as um, via sound and meaning parallelisms. So for example, um, in eight, the name Amina in Amina, why, why on earth are you so dirty? gives a clue to the gender of the solution, um, which is broom. And then in another example from Alagua in nine, uh, we have three clues to the solution that are provided by the person reference in the description. So the first name Marbu clearly alliterates with the solution. Um, the second name there, Odai, is derived from the ordinary noun um, meaning red sorghum. So it points to the semantic domain of the solution germinated grains. Um, and the reference to their wives probably points to the feminine gender of the solution as well. And uh, another example of a semantic clue is from the riddle I gave you earlier from Iraq, Faro her herds from a high cliff um, for moon where the name Faro means counting uh, and provides a conceptual link to the answer because the moon is is used to count the days. So we find these really, really lovely connections um, between the description and the solution. Um, so we're seeing, yeah, lots of very creative use of the linguistic resources that speakers have to hand. It's likely that there's a lot of other associations with, with names going on within these riddles that are very difficult to uncover without, um, without the kind of rich insider knowledge that you need. Much more that we could say about the conceptual properties of riddles, but this was just to give you a taste of some of the work we've been doing. And uh, so in sort of lieu of, of conclusions, uh, we kind of wanted to uh, make this talk rather on the shorter side, and we wanted to pose some questions and, and, and to sort of have some discussion um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to sort of um, report back on what we found, but also to to get some ideas that will hopefully sustain us for 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 the next uh, round of writing and building on on these ideas. So, I, I guess sort of a general question is, what is language specific here, and what is shared? So, uh, and 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 what do we need to know in order to properly answer these questions to do it in a methodical way? Um, we have some specific questions as well. So, for example, why don't Hadza have riddles? This was something that Richard and I both looked at during our uh, documentary work and uh, asked our local researchers, you know, can you record Hadza riddles? And um, it was really the only thing that they that they said, no, we don't we don't have these. We, don't, we can't find them. I encountered um, some young Hadza boys riddling at their mother's house. Uh, one afternoon, but these were Swahili riddles that they learned at school. So, um, you know, in terms of in terms of a Hadza language uh, tradition, we we've yet to find it, and and our, our our local researchers have said no, we we don't we don't have that. So, I mean, that's really interesting, given that you know almost uniformly everywhere else in all the other linguistic groups that we work with, there there are riddle traditions, and, and they're often very robust. Um. Also, uh, so another sort of specific question is, do we see a revival in riddling in any contexts or is their declining use sort of a widespread phenomenon? Another specific question that we might wanna talk about is, should we distinguish these short, -term, ter these short form riddles from the ones which, which are sort of longer and almost resemble um, these dilemma tales? 
And, um, and then sort of a more general question is, what will we actually be able to say about contact and convergence and aerial features and so forth, you know, given the medium that we're working in, in the riddle, like what do we need to do here? Um, and, and, how do we, and how do we go about that? So these are some of the things that we might want to discuss. And of course, any of your thoughts or comments or questions are always welcome as well. Before we move on to that though, I'd like to acknowledge the fact again, as Alice said at the beginning, we're the ones who were talking, but, but this is actually the product of an awful lot of work from very many people. And we're very happy that um, we could sort of facilitate that with the Rift Valley Network. And um, yeah, and we hope to, and we hope to continue uh, sort of fostering that dynamic because uh, it's been really fun. And I think that we've all learned a lot, um, you know, uh, relying on, on all of our uh, different contributions. So that's been great. Um, I'll, give, uh, I'll give our references now um, and uh, then we can uh, move on to uh, questions, I guess. Thank you very much, Alice and Andrew, for this really interesting update. Yeah, so we can move on to the question and answer section. Um, so as always, you can either post your question in the chat and I will read it out or you can raise your hand and I will send a request to unmute. Um, and please remember that the webinars are being recorded. So if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. I see that Bonnie has raised her hand, so we'll go there first. Hi, thanks for the talk. You know, I've participated in the reading groups. I participated in the... Uh, in the workshop, but I feel like I learned a lot listening oh. to this talk today. So it was really enjoyable. And it was nice to see everything summarized, you know, in this way. So I feel like this is just a great paper, even if you're not, you know, coming up with a great, oh, this is how we borrowed things, you know, that's that, that would just be extra. I think that's everything, every linguist would find this fascinating. Thank you, Bonnie. That's really helpful feedback, especially because you, as you said, you've You've been along for quite a lot of the journey, but it's, if you can see some progress there, that's that's really nice to hear. I don't see any other hands for the moment, so I'll um, add a comment for myself. Um, so I see that you have, uh, do we see a revival in Riddling? You know, I, I don't really have an answer to that, obviously, but um, I have found some Riddling on a um, online Facebook group. So I think maybe social media and these kind of places might be um, interesting to keep an eye on. I, I don't think it's very widespread. I've only seen a few people actually initiate, but um, there's a lot of people responding with responses in the comments that you can leave on Facebook, which is really nice to see. And it's quite creative as well. So I think the riddle was something like the, the bad hyena has devastated our lands, which I think the traditional answer would be something along the lines of taxes. Um, but nowadays it's 2021 and it's on Facebook. So one of the answers was also Corona. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Um, also, you just made me think the short form of the riddle is kind of ideal for Twitter, right? Uh, <laughs> maybe we could see a revival, revival there. Yeah, that's really interesting. It would be nice to uh, it'd be nice to see that uh, those Facebook uh, exchanges see uh, see what's going on there. That's very cool. I can send you some of the ones that I have and see if I can find a few. Yeah, yeah do it. That'd be great. Um, Olan has raised his hand. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Alice and uh, Andrew for the well. Uh, the summary or tying this up uh, in a very concise way. I was impressed by it and I can uh, support uh, uh, Bonnie's <laughs> impression. Uh, it looks like a, a big thing. And I have two points um, for comments uh, with uh, regard, first of all, to the question in the end, the dilemma tales or the kind of... Uh, yeah, delimitation of riddles from dilemma tales, but maybe I'm mistaken. My first uh, impression about the dilemma tales reading Bascom uh, is uh, that there actually is a difference because in the prototypical dilemma tale is uh, actually longer and it doesn't seem to have a fixed answer. That is, uh, it's uh, the, the general point in that actually seems to be like instigating some type of uh, vivid uh, or lively discussion about who uh, who did who performed the biggest feat of all and uh, things like that but with no uh, particular solution in the end maybe uh, this um, this would serve as a 
um, way to distinguish these two genres uh, on the on the level of prototypicality or something like that. But of course, there's a spectrum of uh, one blending into the other, maybe. Um, that's uh, one comment. And the other was something uh, that you pointed out in the beginning about the, um, well, the, uh, Mm, the routine in 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 riddling the uh, communicative routine, especially with regard to the fail path, uh, which uh, seems uh, to be under research to some extent. And uh, going through these Alagua riddles once again, I'm uh, I'm sorry, Alice, I haven't yet yet sent them to you, but uh, it takes a longer time to put them in order. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> for the riddler to accept the payment uh, in the end. That is something not just like saying I've accepted it, but it's uh, some fixed expression, uh, which means some, which seems to be associated with uh, accepting some, um, some nice, uh, some nice um, meal or something like that. Uh, along that line, but I'm not quite sure. I wonder if it might uh, be worthwhile to look into these um, routines of accepting the payment. Thank you. I, I think that that's a really good point and it's worth, um, it's worth sort of um, uh, fleshing out a little bit more in that, um, in that discourse section. I think that that makes a lot of uh, sense actually. Yeah, thanks, Holland, for those two comments. Um, yeah, that's a really, really interesting avenue for us to, to go down to make our, our document even longer than it already is. Um, with respect to the dilemma tales, thank you for, um, for that clarification, because that wasn't something I was actually familiar with as a genre. So, so, so a dilemma tale then is more about uh, perhaps inciting some debate and, and things like that, which is very interesting. I guess one thing I'm I was thinking about is um you know is it is it the case that for some communities having you know a very simple very very simple form is valued and and that's what makes a good riddle is that the, the prototypical form um or is it you know is it actually not so much about about that formal aspect I mean thinking about English riddles you also get quite long forms like the um the one about going to St Ives that maybe some of you know where you you know that's many 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 lines but I think people would still call that a riddle and that's another test I suppose is the kind of language internal classification of these things you know would they agree that that this is whatever the word for riddle is um yeah and I think also for the two Alagua ones that we currently have in our spreadsheet are quite long aren't they um or a bit longer so they're long and the answers are three, I think are three separate things. Mm. They're, uh, and, and they're somewhat different in that sense, yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, don't worry Roland, whenever you get to time to send me the, the data, it's welcome. <laughs> but I think uh, just a footnote on, on that, uh, the, um, it's also, it's uh, that long riddle, the Alagua one also seems to be a, uh, in, uh, with respect to the Alagua uh, riddling culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Michael has raised his hands. Yes. Um, thank you, Andrew and Alice, for a good presentation. Um, um, sorry, I didn't get much time to work on readers, but I hope if, if anybody is allowed to join this project um, currently, I, I would love to get an outline from Alice, for example, and see what, how I can contribute. Um, I had a comment on, for example, how whether we see any revival in riddling um, in any context. I, I thought of, I quickly thought of um, TV programs that nowadays, um, you know, um, uh, air, for example, um, during weekends, we have uh, some TV programs where they have riddles, they have uh, school children. Um, you know, meeting uh, in the studios and trying to do some riddling. And um, mostly uh, they are Israeli riddles, but I think it's, it's, it's another way of, um, you know, 
practicing this kind of uh, genre um, in, in, in our societies. And um, it's, it's up to discussion whether that can be considered as another or a modern way of um, practicing uh, riddling. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, that's a really interesting point and one we should definitely incorporate in our discussion of sort of vitality of the genre, even if it's restricted to Swahili at the moment, you know, you maybe could imagine it having an effect on people's attitudes towards riddling traditions elsewhere as well. So very interesting, thank you. And also just to point out, you are very much already part of this project, Michael. <laughs> I, I uh, yeah, you contributed a great deal already, thank you. I don't yeah, know if Andrew uh, has some comment, yeah. Yeah, the, this sort of image of, of the television as, as a contemporary hearth is kind of interesting. <laughs> the, the television or maybe the internet, I mean, because the, the, there is certainly more of an interactive, you know, an interactive dynamic with the internet, but also, yeah, the television, this idea of these, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I think Crispin has also talked a bit about, you know, riddles being quite vital, Swahili riddles being quite vital still in, in being used in schools and so on. Um, mm -hmm. what the question is whether that's to the detriment to, of other riddling traditions or could could play a, ben, a ben, beneficial role. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. I have this in regard to uh, revival. Uh, my worry is that um, with the ethnic languages riddle, I don't know we, if we can have a uh, program in the television that we can uh, a session for riddle for languages that are not formally, um, of course, languages that are restricted into informal domains. So I think we need to have uh, like uh, another alternative because it is uh, this context of um, uh, indigenous riddling uh, that restricted children to riddle, uh, but also the culture or the social dynamic that there are changes that uh, now children are not riddling in their environment at homes, maybe during the evening due to other issues. So what I, I I think it's like Kiswahili riddling will continue, but this other riddling from indigenous language uh, will a little bit difficult to revive as far as the context is uh, concerned, but also these other issues like uh, the time of riddling and the transmission of the riddles to the children is no longer existing. So that to me is like uh, difficult to revive these uh, uh, the indigenous languages riddles to these uh, children or young generation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Crispina. I think uh, it's a it's a very good point, and it's it's difficult to think about what kinds of contexts, what kinds of alternatives there might be without, yeah, some. I mean, if there was more support for um, language, mi minority language preschools or something like this, you could imagine mm -hmm. a context for riddles. But of course, these don't really exist in Tanzania. A lot yeah, of the but... people that, that I spoke to said, well, when we come home from, from work all day, we're exhausted and we can't do these things, right? <laughs> The other issue is that also the young parents, they don't have a riddles knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it is also difficult. Young parents like uh, take an example of um, most of the uh, young parents like uh, having 40, yeah, 42 minus 40. They have done such kind of knowledge for readers for most of the Iraq. I don't know for other languages. So it is difficult to, to, to transmit because they don't have a knowledge, they don't have a time. Yeah. They are busy with other tasks. It's, I think it is a bit challenge with the revival of these 
um, can say indigenous or local mm -hmm. readers. So uh, all the more important that we document them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And maybe to document it both orally and uh, in a written form if yeah. possible. Yeah. And uh, like thinking of having an app for the reader later so that they can be used, uh, children can listen, they can admire, they can like it and they practice. That's a great idea, Crispina. Could get, a, could get an older speaker in each of these languages to do to give the riddles and then mm -hmm. uh, and then the children or there would be there would be a, a, an opportunity to answer and the yeah. answer would be there or something that that could be that could be doable actually you could you could gamify that I think that's kind of a neat idea yeah, yeah I like it I think that'd be relatively straightforward as an app as well yeah yeah, yeah. um I don't know if anybody has anything uh, to say about our first specific question. Uh, and it sounds very absolute. It's almost scary to write it down. Um, but, but really, I, I, we, we, tried to, we tried to look for these Hadza riddles and, uh, and we couldn't find any. Um, I've done a lot of thinking myself about this. And um, sort of when I've spoken to other people, we've had discussions about this um, in our reading groups and things. And um, sort of when we look at the idea of riddling, riddling there's like, there's, an, there's a challenge inherent in sort of the riddle game. So there's, there's challenging, there's people working almost at odds with each other, right? Somebody has something and they have to, and they have to keep it from them. This is my, you know, this is essentially my property, which you have to buy in order to to have my riddle belongs to me but sort of the underscore the, the underlying metaphor to this buying and selling it's often uh, it's often not simply just a simple exchange right often the buying and selling has to do with people that are often thought of as laborers if the people are are if people are bought or if you buy a riddle with people often they're uh, they're they're metaphorically brought to your household compound and they will help you farm uh, if it's a place, um, you know, you're, you're going to a place and you're going to be occupying space to farm there. So there's, if it's, if it's food, you know, it's brought to my compound and that's going to feed my, my, my sons and things. So I'm wondering if sort of, you know, for, for, for Hadza people who, who don't engage in, 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 who don't engage in amassing wealth, for example, in these ways, in these specific ways, I wonder if just the metaphor is 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 not is not applicable, and so and so sort of the riddling game doesn't really doesn't really jive with with at least what the what the what the sort of contemporary reality was for for many Hadza speakers. I wonder if that's relevant or not. Um, if 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 it is something to do with you know socioeconomic practice or whatever, we might expect that we wouldn't find riddles in other hunter gatherer groups and um i don't know I, I don't know whether we do or not I, there's, a, yeah. there's a recent book edited by um tom Goldman and some others on the language of hunter gatherers and i did a very quick search for riddle the other day and i didn't find anything in there unfortunately so um yeah i don't know if any anyone amongst us has has some insight there but um that would be one way to kind of address that question maybe andrew this is worth uh, firing off an email to our colleagues at the uh, Kalahari Basin Network. Maybe yeah. they'll be able to help us out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, also elsewhere in the world, like I don't know if you find riddles in, in Australia. Um, mm. so it would be worth looking into. Mm. Yeah. But interesting idea, Andrew. I'll throw it out there. I know that this is this this is a friendly environment. <laughs> well, I think one thing that we probably could agree on is that this isn't a case of Hadza having lost riddling tradition because of you know language obsolescence. We just think that they've never had them. They think mm. that they've never had them. So just even stating that is is something. Yeah. And certainly there's a lot of literature about hunter-gatherer childhoods and Hadza childhood um, ways of learning that we can refer to about, you know, Hadza children are, are just small, little autonomous people, little adults, right, in some ways. So this stuff. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think maybe just to make the point that they don't have riddles and to give some support for that, you know, why that, that makes sense in their culture as, as, as opposed to a full explanation perhaps yeah. might be helpful. Yeah. That's also, I think, a very useful um, distinction to make uh, in that we don't expect the Hadza Riddling tradition to have become obsolete, but actually just never, never really existed. Um, so that that's actually that's actually a useful thing to distinction to make. And I think I did look in my Khoisan and did found some Damara riddles, but that was all. But nothing else for any other Southern African Khoisan. Cool. And Damara, yeah, questionable. You know, not really hunter gatherers anyway. So. Hmm. All right, I think we can then wrap it up for today. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley uh, Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Um, looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 15th of uh, December. It's going to be presented by Stanislav Bilecki, and it's titled Songs as an Element of the Hansu Fairy Tales. And I would like to thank Alice and Andrew again for this really interesting update. I look forward to the next one. Uh, and of course, everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.